Hello and welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Framework Podcast. I'm one of your two hosts, Jamie Hopkins, uh, joined with Anna and then Gabe Rissman here today, CEO and founder of your stake or co-founder too, right? Is that you guys uh, did that together, which we'll get to part of your story here. But excited to have you on, especially this week. We're talking a little bit about ESG and a couple different uh, uh, avenues of it. So I'm excited for the conversation today and learn a little bit about your stake, even though I, I did see uh, earlier, I don't know when exactly it came out, but you were featured in that wealth management uh, 10 to watch uh, for 2022. So congrats on that. I know a couple of the other Thank people you. in there too. So it's uh, very exciting. But Gabe, yeah, thanks for being here today. Yeah, excited to be on. Thanks for inviting me. And I'm excited to uh, have this conversation with you guys and share a little bit of the story and uh, hopefully provide some good insights. The uh, first thing is, I guess, the 30 seconds of who you are, what you do. Uh, the, I kind of gave a little bit of that. But for people who don't know you or aren't aware of you, could you just give us that quick, uh, what do you do here today? And then we'll we'll get into your story a lot deeper as we go. Sure. So uh, as you mentioned, I'm the co-founder and president of Your Stake. Our mission is to help make ESG conversations easier and help advisors personalize ESG, make it more explainable, make it more transparent, build trust. That's around gathering clients' values. That's around impact reporting. That's around portfolio construction. So we provide a full suite of tools as Your Stake to help advisors feel really confident navigating ESG. Um, and to be able to serve clients across a whole range of different needs. That's awesome. Well, Anna, if it, people are, are watching today, has on the, the bright yellow, and she's got her energy <laughs> from that. I was living off of coffee, and I ran out of coffee beans today, so tomorrow is going to be a little dangerous since I haven't ordered any yet. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's told you, you're going to have to share the yellow with me for tomorrow. But. <laughs> Uh, we'll send you a yellow shirt for your Mondays from now on, Jamie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of our first questions we always ask, Gabe, is just a kind of an icebreaker, and it's about food. So what's your you know, mm. favorite food item, favorite, you know, favorite type of cuisine, whatever food kind of means to you, what pops into your mind? It's a great question. I am a big fan. In my neighborhood, I live in Brooklyn in Prospect Park South, and they have the best jerk chicken uh, around. But I think... What I really like right now, and there are a couple of restaurants that are great, is um, Ethiopian food and Thai food. And probably Ethiopian is my number one at this point because it's just something that you can uh, have a little bit of everything. They have a lot of really nice platters and it's uh, really good and don't get sick of it. So that's my number one right now. Oh, those are both good choices. I love Ethiopian food. But um, yeah, so another fun question we like to ask is, um, what was your first big purchase that you remember making? Wow, <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, it's funny, I, I buy as little as I possibly can. Uh, <laughs> and <Solid answer. laughs> yeah, I, I think, uh, I can't remember, Rent, I think, would be a big purchase or uh, like a really nice dinner or something like that. I don't often buy too many things for, I guess, just a, a vacation would be something like that. Uh, oh, that's a but, good one. <laughs> yeah. Jamie's was a fog machine that he talks about a lot. He talks about his <laughs> fog machine. <laughs> in, in what context do you use it? Uh, I use it for Halloween, but uh, that's where I bought it for. I've used it for a band I played in before, too. But, yeah, that was my first real big purchase. Uh, are you a big so uh, music fan? I can see half of the the, the miles uh, yeah, in the background there. So are you a big kind of jazz? And uh, do you play the trumpet, too? <laughs> yeah, I, I grew up playing trumpet. was a big Miles Davis fan, and... Actually, it used to always grow, go to the Lincoln Center where they had jazz for kids and watch Wynton Marsalis play. Oh. Uh, and my, when I was 13, uh, I got this for my bar mitzvah as bar mitzvah present. And I've always kept this Miles Davis poster right behind me ever since. So, uh, yeah, absolutely a big fan. Sounds That's like it might be another good fit for the FinTwit band you're building, Jamie. <laughs> 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 yeah, we, we, I don't believe that we have anyone who plays the trumpet yet. So this is a new addition, a strong one here. Because yeah, if we're if we're gonna build a yeah, if we're gonna build a full 
you know, like a full piece band, we're going to need some additional skills. So far, we've been a little little limited on our, uh, I, I think, our, well, you, you play what, keyboard or something too, Anna? Is that right? Yeah, or just singing? Yeah, I play singing? the piano. Yeah. It's the piano. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's keyboard. We but can't yeah, so do you're in Gabe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dr. Uh, you know, who, who else has been in the band so far? So, um, Dr. Daniel Crosby, yeah. I think, is in the band. He was the founding member, yeah. so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we had somebody not too long ago. Was it Nicole that wanted to be in, too, I think? Um, was it Nicole Casperson? Emily? Emily? Oh, Emily. Emily. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Emily was uh, the other one that wanted to join. Yeah, she's a big fan of Tool, also, which is one of my favorite mm-hmm. bands. So, uh, did you play, like, uh, like I'm, I'm assuming... Uh, you know, school band, do you play all the way through college? Do you still play today? I wish. I have my trumpet <laughs> sitting in my closet and got to take it out again, but I don't think my neighbors would be super happy <laughs> um, <laughs> living in Brooklyn, although they've they've done worse, so maybe I'll get them back. Um, but yeah, if there's a fog machine involved, then, then please let me join this <laughs> band. Uh, <laughs> that's a big sell. <laughs> yeah, the fog machine gets people to do a lot of things, I think. That's fun. Yeah. Good time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure that your origin story did not start, uh, you know, thinking, hey, I'm going to go into financial services and have a ESG type uh, plan. So when you uh, went to college, I know that's uh, in your story a little bit when I read up about it before. Mm-hmm. But tell us a little bit about that and just uh, how your co-founder, you kind of came together in college. And, you know, yeah, I'd love to hear that story. Sure. <laughs> we definitely did not know we were going to be doing this. I think like most people. Uh, my dad actually had a split career between archaeology and finance and recommended against both. Uh, <laughs> so I, I saw myself never going into this because he always gave horror stories about it. So, uh, But I was really interested in uh, environmentalism and climate change. And when I was a student, I, I started college in 2012, right when this new thing called the fossil fuel divestment movement was getting started. And I had I'd never heard of it before. I didn't know what divestment meant. I didn't know what really much about investing at all, but it seemed like something to learn about and something that could be potentially impactful, which I think that kind of mindset is how a lot of people are coming into ESG and sustainable investing now. It's, oh, there's here's a cool thing. Like, does it do anything? Is it real? Is it impactful? But it, will it harm my portfolio? It, it's a lot of exploration right now, and but there's a lot of curiosity and interest. Uh, so we were, this fossil fuel divestment campaign was essentially trying to push Yale to stop investing in fossil fuel companies. Uh, but as students, my co-founder and I did a lot more. So we were leading the fossil fuel divestment campaign but also we're running the Undergraduate Socially Responsible Investment Fund and ended up uh, not just looking at divestment, but what should our proxy voting look like? How should we be performing ESG integration? And a bigger challenge, how do we as a group of people figure out what our values are and how we want to incorporate that into our investments uh, as a committee? And, And how do we come to an agreement on that? Does ESG actually create impact? And if so, how? Um, so we ended up really diving into those questions, ended up filing a shareholder resolution uh, as students with Exxon and learning about that whole process. And uh, at the end of college, we were just fascinated by the potential for impact that ESG could have. And we dove into the academic literature. We wanted to see, is there evidence of, of success? Does this actually make a difference? And what are the challenges? What's holding back the field? And we found that, man, ESG and sustainable investing can create tremendous impact at scale. And it's already creating a lot of impact. This was back in 2016 with with very little scale. Uh, One of my favorite stats right now is there are currently, according to the CFA Institute, 10% of people that actually align their investments with their values. And there are 85% plus people, according to Morgan Stanley Investment Research, that are actually looking to align their investments with their values. So there's this gap of 10% that are doing it and 85% plus that want it. Why does that exist? What is the problem and how much impact could be created by helping to solve that? So the story continues where we, we saw that there was this need and looked at what 
what we could do to help address and identify some solutions and realize that that very much related to our personal experience as running this uh, socially responsible investment fund. Um, so happy to get into more of the problem that we identified and what we try to do at your stake. But that was kind of the origin story was we're student activists. Looks like sustainable investment can create a lot of impact. What's the problem and, and what's needed? So Gabe, I'm interested to hear um, how you kind of have seen the ESG space evolve or grow since that time, since 2016 to now. Like, what are some trends you're noticing or some things that, that have changed? Yeah, I, I could even give 2019 to now uh, because there's so much has happened in the last three years. And in 2016, I think it was the beginning of a changing tide. And then things really started to transform in 2019. So in 2019, that was, I think, the year that people started becoming aware of ESG. And people started asking questions. And it was a lot of times being dismissed. And uh, there was a lot of confusion about ESG. But it, it started to be on more people's minds. 2020, I think, was a year of exploration. Hey, you know, the pandemic... It, people still care about these issues during the pandemic. And in fact, people care more about these issues during the pandemic. And there was Black Lives Matter. There was a whole bunch of climate energy. Um, and we, as your stake, instead of when we were talking to advisors, they in 2019 would get questions about ESG and they would say, ah, I've never heard these questions before. I'm going to ignore it. In 2020, they said, all right, I'm getting these questions. Let me take a look. Let's see what's going on. And then 2021 was a year of just amazing growth. And now it's still advisors getting questions about ESG, but now instead of exploring, they want to dive in. Advisors know that this is the future. Advisors know that this is the present and they can differentiate their practice based on ESG and they're going to fall behind if they don't. So I think that along with that, it's been a change of attitude from advisors and how to respond to it. It's also been a change of understanding of ESG. So I think 2019 ESG, a lot of people thought of it as one size fits all. Here are my non-ESG clients, here are my ESG clients. And nowadays, a lot of times we don't even like to use the word ESG because it just has so many different meanings. And <laughs> Maybe we should dive into that more. And it also turns people off where it shouldn't. There's so many people that really want to align their investments with their values, but they heard something about ESG and they think it's not for them when the underlying concept, it actually really is what they care about. So we, we coach a lot of our advisors to not, if they want to bring up values-based investing with their clients, not say, hey, do you want ESG? How much do you care about it? But are you guided by your faith? Uh, do you think that companies should pay workers a living wage? Do you think all these different behavioral questions, do you go out of your way to reduce your environmental footprint? Do you own a gun? All these questions, hey, you know, are you interested in aligning your investments with the way that you live your life and the way that you think about how society should act? So that's another major change is the, the coming of personalization uh, in ESG. And then also just the last thing that I'd say, and maybe the biggest thing overall in terms of what's changed in the last couple of years, for decades and decades and decades, the big concern about values-based investing was financial performance. By, by far, nothing else even came close. And then four really legit papers came out last year from, from big asset management organizations. And they all had very similar conclusions that data quality of ESG and greenwashing have started to top investor concerns, more so than financial performance. That's partly because the myth of underperformance has been dispelled. And it's also partly because people are realizing and caring more and more about these issues and they want to make sure they're not being fooled. And, they're, and greenwashing feel like a definition would be helpful. It's when a fund or company's marketing outpaces their actual activities. And people don't want to be fooled and misled and mismarketed. So that's now becoming uh, the biggest concern along with the SG data quality uh, in this field. So lots changed. <laughs> Gabe, what do you think? I mean, is it that type of behavior, the greenwashing, the marketing of you know, behavior, I guess, uh, or action that created this almost, I don't know if it's negative, but uh, somebody told me, <laughs> I, I think it was that it felt very worn, almost tired, 
like the ESG moniker, right? That uh, you kind of, we almost need to get beyond that term because a lot of people look at that and go, oh yeah, well, ESG and, you know, that's been around forever and it didn't really do anything, right? And like, they kind of dismiss it due to the name. And so what what are some of the, like, do you think that there's three or four things that contributed to that? Um I, I don't really know, right? Because I, I, I didn't spend a lot of time with ESG, you know, in the 1990s and 2000s when it was kind of around then. And I, I know that there's a lot of investors that kind of lost, you know, interest in it for then. And that's why you probably see this 10% and 85%. And we have this gap and people look at it and think it's a little tired. So how do, you know, what is it that caused that, I guess, in your view? Sure. I think there are two ways that I could interpret that question. The first, like back in the 90s, ESG was really known as socially responsible investing, SRI. And a lot of what that was, was negative exclusions. Let's exclude some industries that are unsavory to a particular client. A lot of times it was guided by faith. Faith Faith-based investors were some of the largest SRI investors. And it did underperform. Negative exclusionary approach, I think avoiding SIN stocks. SIN stocks outperformed um, over substantial time periods, but I think people have that in their heads. Modern ESG is very different from that. Uh, and it, I, I don't think that it's my role to make the financial performance case for ESG. Usually when we are serving advisors, it's advisors that already realize this is something that will help their clients and now they want to communicate it or they want to do it best or they want to be able to research and build things. So we're not often doing that convincing, but there's a large body of research that has shown that ESG, when done right, uh, it's just better investing. It's looking at all the risk factors that are actually material to a company and happy to share resources after the uh, call that you could put put links in the description type of thing. Um, So I think that people definitely still have that perception of underperformance, but I don't think it's really justified anymore. The second thing is when you say tired, I think everyone has an ESG product now Uh, and how much effort and thought is really being put into that is a big question and how much can you trust it? How much different is it going to be? There's a lot of evidence of ESG funds that have the same top holdings as their non ESG counterpart. So I think that's another way that people could say it's tired is yeah. What am I really getting? It's kind of just a, a, a nice label and that's true for some funds and some ESG investment products, but many are doing a really, really good job. And they're unfortunately getting obscured by some of these um, bad actors. What uh, what actually got you to say, we're going to go into the ESG or this investing side and pick the advisor angle. So that's the part that I, you know, uh, it doesn't shock me that, you know, two activists at school that I think you said you were on the bullhorn one time, you know, <laughs> there at school and, you know, end up in, you know, uh, investing and trying to, you know, impact the world in a positive way on that side. But it is interesting to me that you end up with the advisor angle, because obviously you could go consumer angle, tech angle, right? It, you know, fund angle. There's a lot of different ways to go here. So what what brought you to the advisor world? Sure. So a couple things. First is just our own skill set uh, as founders was in data science and in software development and building really cool tools. So I I would be happy to tell you about how dark matter halos are very close to ESG data, uh, and it's fascinating. I like the the t- the data quality and the techniques you need to use to scrape and clean it. It's it's honestly really fun. So we love doing that stuff, and we are able to contribute in that way. Uh, that's a big part of it. And the second thing is, I think the advisor community is the most important community uh, for sustainable investing by far. Asset managers can come up with really cool products, but if advisors aren't listening to what clients care about and like pushing for solutions, then advisors and asset managers aren't going to create really cool products. Like, I believe in demand uh, leading to positive change demand being the mechanism that drives innovation. And I think advisors are the ones that are aggregating and creating and communicating the demand that leads to these good products that leads to actual impact. And I think that consumers, obviously they're even one level down on the, (laughs) they're forming the demand for the advisors, but consumers 
we saw after talking to a lot of consumers have a lot of fear about making their own financial decisions. And it, their ideal is to find an advisor that can take care of ESG for them. And we did obviously look at the consumer side and look at other side of things. Uh, consumers wanted their advisor to do it for them and advisors wanted to be able to provide this service to their clients and, and be able to differentiate and serve them better. Uh, so I think that's the main reason why advisors are, are the gatekeepers. They're the critical points in driving sustainable investing forward. I've got, I have one more follow up there and then Anna, I'll let you take the next one just because I had a thought that came to my head. And I don't know if you saw this in any of that research, Gabe, but it almost kind of almost implied by the statement, or at least my brain implied it. Is there mm -hmm. some notion that maybe people who care very heavily about sustainable investing, are they more likely to search out an advisor due to that maybe fear of the complexity around is this really matching up with my values? Will I know? Is it being greenwashed? I, I don't know if you looked at that, right? Because that's an interesting, th that's an interesting piece. Because I think immediately, like, not that I don't care, but I don't currently align uh, values with my investments, and I, I'm, you know, I, I then take more of a whole market approach to investing, right? I don't really care because it's a very simple approach. I guess as it gets more complex, do you, do you is there any notion that people then become more right looking for guidance and help from an advisor or similar person, or do they actually become more invested as a do it yourself or researching and diving into it, or do you know that? I honestly can't say that I'm yeah. sure on that. It's a really interesting question. I do, I can give you anecdotes and examples of both. <laughs> so it, it, I don't know which direction and which uh, weight is stronger, but yeah, some people, if they really care about sustainable investing, they might not trust the, the, the traditional system uh, or what financial advisors might be saying. They might want to do their own research and verify the credibility, especially with greenwashing claims. So they might not seek out an advisor. But I've also known so many people that, even peers and, uh, and, and neighbors and whoever it may be, they go to an advisor because they care about this and they want someone that's an expert. So it's both for sure. Yeah, well, thanks so for that. Ta <laughs> Talk to us a little bit about how you think um, our industry has the power to create positive change in the world and the role that your company is playing in that. Sure. Yeah, that's a the theory of change question is, is the most fun one. Thank you for asking that one. Um, I guess a vision of what could be different is... Uh, companies really being, I guess, held accountable is one way of saying it, but aligning their incentives with what their shareholders care about, uh, becoming more democratic in that sense. There's a lot of goal for, uh, for shareholder democracy to be more real. And the thing that's holding that back is uh, lack of information and lack of transparency and lack of tools and ability to be able to do things. But... Uh, I think that it's a really great thing when you can have positive impact by just eliminating information barriers and by being able to provide the options and knowledge for people to be able to align their investments with their values. That means that companies will be operating in a way that their shareholders care about more and they'll be operating in a way that is better for society in the way that their shareholders want that to be. Um, and we've seen a lot of evidence of that being tremendously positive. So there's a lot of examples. I am a climate activist, so of course I'm gonna come up with examples, but there's a ton of examples of companies that have stopped obstructing climate policy as a result of shareholder pressure. There's a lot of examples of companies setting really strong climate goals, and there's a lot of examples of companies adding more uh, gender diversity to their boards, and there's a lot of examples of companies uh, improving their worker treatment and uh, doing audits of their supply chain to make sure there's no forced labor or sex trafficking within their supply chain. A lot of this stuff is driven by investor demand and that's on the margins. That's like a couple loud people trying to make a fuss, but with an entire society or an entire economy aligning their investments with their values, that's just going to be table stakes that, that companies will have to be aware of their impact and they'll have to do something about it and know that they'll be held accountable to it. So that is so exciting to me, this concept of a shareholder democracy where companies are doing what their shareholders and, and what their stakeholders 
actually want and need. I think it just leads to a, a much better society overall. When you when you look at that impact, I guess a question or kind of push on this is, uh, and using one of the, the words not in a jokingly way, but do you believe that sustainable change or is that the kind of, you know, reactionary change due to pressure and then as soon as you stopped pressuring because you, you know, hey, we need to care about this and, you know, three, four years later, um, have you have, have you noticed or do you have even the anecdotal that companies might slip back towards old behavior? I know with hiring, that's been the case, right? There's been pressures on large companies to equalize hiring and even pay. And then you go back and you look six, seven years later and it tends to slip back towards, right, unequal hiring and pay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, this was a huge component of the academic literature review that we did when deciding to start your stake. And yes, if shareholders are pressuring companies to make a change, then there's, there is potential for a slip back. But what we found is that most of the time, it's not like a one-time engagement and then you're done. Like these share owners are keeping companies in their portfolios and they're having meetings with management all the time. And there's a consistent, uh, market demand for companies to have strong environmental records. Like that's something that, so there, there's two components. The first is shareholder engagement. Like I've been talking about, it's shareholders literally talking, having dialogue with companies saying, Hey, you should make this change for social and environmental reasons. And that's something that it does require consistent interaction, but that's a natural thing for investors to consistently interact with their portfolio companies. And then the second is just the market signals of investors demanding companies w by voting with their dollars, essentially, not with their not with their voice, allocating capital in particular ways. And that's another thing that I think the proliferation of ESG data is really helping with that. If, if investors decide that they want to be aligned with positive ESG companies, they will invest in alignment with particular data uh, that allows them to express their ESG thesis. And the ESG data companies will continue to create that data and allow investors to stay aligned. Um, and that will continue to have incentives for companies to be aligned with positive ESG metrics. So I, I'm not so worried about those issues, even though they are real. Do most people start here in the conversation around values first? Um, or like, where do they come into this conversation? Is it that I care, like, as you said, do people more view themselves as activists in certain areas and then get interested or do they start with kind of a value-based approach first? Definitely not. I, I sometimes hesitate to talk about my activist background because it's not sustainable investing is not a thing for climate activists exclusively at all. And most people that are looking for ESG and sustainable investing have never uh, held a protest sign and that's perfectly fine. Uh, and, and that is why I personally am passionate. But when we talk to advisors, a lot of times it's, oh man, I have this really big prospect and they say they care a lot about ESG. What do I do? Uh, it's usually just how can you better serve clients? And, and a lot of times there was an amazing study. I'm forgetting who put this out. 95% of advisors received some question about values-based investing from their clients in 2021. 95%, which is really incredible to me that it's no longer the case that advisors have to bring up values investing to their clients. They are getting those questions. Now it's just a matter of how much are you going to focus on serving that as your niche? And then if 95% of people are getting some question, you know that there's plenty of people that are not bringing it up. But if you bring it up as an advisor, well, that's a way that you can be stickier. That's a way that you can differentiate. And it's not, hey, are you an activist? Do you want to change the world with ESG? That's that's really not it. We found that it's much better to say, hey, like we can help you invest, align your investments with your values. Uh, what are some issues that you care about? Do you think that... Uh, I think I mentioned a couple before. Do you think society should focus on fixing problems like climate change? Do you think that society should extend extra opportunities to historically oppressed minority? Like we have a questionnaire that I'm kind of saying some things for, but 
having a conversation with clients, not about, are you an ESG client, but do you think prisons are just, <laughs> um, and that's something that goes across the aisle, right? That's one of the major bipartisan things on private prisons of the last couple of years. Do you think prisons are just, do you want to invest in private prisons? That is a huge thing that advisors should, should be asking their clients. Um, and it will be really positive and beneficial if you ask that question without judgment and without, oh, you should be an activist like me, or right? it's not about that. It's, is this something that you want to explore the conversation? Do you want to go down this route? And we can help serve you. We have tools for that. All right. I'm deviating a little, Anna, so you're going to get mad at me go now. Ahead. So the uh, I, it's a question <laughs> for you. It's a question for you. So I'm, I'm go, coming to you. Uh, obviously, you're a very passionate person. Have you done your investing and aligned it with your values as you currently invest? Or have you not? You just kind of pick normal investments. Not. So yeah. see, my, does that mean I'm a sellout? <laughs> not, <laughs> why do you have to do this to me, Jamie? This is not about me. This is about Gabe. <laughs> no, Jamie, well, Gabe, I'm glad you did it. <laughs> <laughs> Gabe brought up a very important, right? I, I am not an activist. I don't put myself into that category with anything. But I think sometimes you put yourself into that category, right? You, you, you care about issues. Yeah. So, right. You care about issues. So I think that a good question is like, why haven't you done this? It is just ease. It's yeah, it's a real question. See, the dog is here asking the same question now, too. Sorry. I'm sorry. Go away. (laughs) He's expecting me to answer this in a profound way. But I think that I, I back to your point, Gabe, about like investors not being certain and wanting the advisor to take that role. I would like my advisor to take that role for me because I am not certain. I don't know how to even approach that, honestly, as a consumer. Um, and my advisor hasn't talked to me about that type of stuff. So she hasn't brought it up with me at all. And that's a good point, Jamie. So maybe we have a meeting on February 11th. Maybe I'll talk <laughs> to her and ask her, hey, Gianna, <laughs> help me out. I'm an activist. Jamie Hopkins told everybody I'm an activist. So I would like to align my investments with my values. Uh, Gabe, we've done this one before, too. Uh, do you personally have an advisor? I uh my dad is an advisor, and uh, so I'm working with him right now, yes. But I've not – if you're going to ask a question of how I chose an advisor, I won't have any good answers for that. But, yeah. Uh, no, so that's actually fine. But, yeah, it's, uh, it's been an interesting piece too, right, that uh, we get very mixed answers on that one. And I need to actually consistently ask it because we get advisors. We get people who serve advisors. And I don't know if it's 50-50, but uh, – it's not, you know, for a group that says, hey, the advisor is really important, which you just told me earlier. It's always nice to say, well, like, you actually use one because sometimes we get, oh, the advisor is the most important relationship. Then we go, do you have one? Oh, well, I don't have one. <laughs> and, um, yeah. you know, <laughs> I would so assume my, that uh, did your my, advisor, my advisor bring is, up the topic uh, or? Oh, he's he's above and beyond. He's really great. <laughs> um, so he uh, organizes something called the Impact Players Alliance where he actually tries to help bring in direct impact investing. And he's working with uh, professional athletes who are trying to do community-based impact. But he's going way above and beyond. Uh, I'm happy to give a plug for him if if you want. But yeah, he's really into this. And then I also, just being interested, have made a lot of personal investing decisions. And I have put together a, a SRI portfolio on my own based on what I know about fund managers that I interact with on a, on a daily basis and who I think is doing really good, credible work. So, um, and it's worked out really well performance wise too. <laughs> so Gabe, I'm curious, you brought up your dad and you had said he told you horror stories about the industry. So I'm curious about like your reality in the industry versus the, the horror stories your dad told you. What, is there a disconnect? What do you, how, how do you feel about that? Uh, every single one of our clients is ridiculously kind. Um, we might just be lucky. It might be because we're providing ESG software, but man, I really, really love interacting with everyone that we're working with. Uh, it, it's really fun. And that was not something, it, it's not sharks. Um, so that's the big thing. It's, uh, and maybe it's also, he was not a, an advisor and advisors I've found. I really like advisors. Advisors want to like figure out what matters to their clients and they have to listen and they have to help their clients actualize their dreams, which is a pretty awesome job. So I, 
I'm a yeah. I, I am a big fan of the uh, advisor industry and what it can do. And that was not the uh, the thing that I was told or was initially exposed to. You're, you just, I think you also said your dad was uh, an archaeologist for a while. So did everybody ask you if your dad was Indiana Jones like growing up? Or that's why that's why he did it. He loved the Indiana Jones <laughs> movies, and that's that's what he wanted to be. But it's a, a lot less uh, <laughs> running away from villains, and a, a lot more brushing things with a, a little paintbrush while crouching for hours and hours and hours. So the, <laughs> that was the. <laughs> he's actually right now in Oman. Uh, doing a dig as we speak okay so brushing that... brushing little walls and artifacts <laughs> <laughs> with a very fine paintbrush that is really cool that's uh, uh i mean i guess it's uh it's kind of uh it's like a discovery uh i, I guess it's like rediscovery right it's maybe a way to look at it you know because you're not really finding something you're you're finding it again <laughs> perhaps yeah that's so a uh, uh, interesting way to look at things uh so Let's talk a little bit about uh, how has your stake uh, evolved from the start, too? As you said, you uh, provide a lot of technology and maybe two things. So how has it evolved? And what's probably the scariest thing moving forward about uh, sustainable investing or ESG, right? What's the thing? Is it backlash mm. against it, right? We've got the, what, Louisiana or something. I, I, I didn't read the whole news thing, but I was coming out and saying, hey, we want ESG out of our pension funds now because they're putting pressure on, you know, fossil fuel or emission things. Is that one of the risks that we have, like, kind of a blowback against it as, you know, the pendulum swings one way or another? Great question. So I'll, I'll start with that one and then I'll go to the initial part of where we've come and what's changed since we started. I think that blowback's been there from the start. I don't think that's new. It's probably getting a little bit more popular because there's just more and more uh, focused on ESG, but I th there's a tremendous amount more in the opposite direction. I think the risks are less blowback on credible ESG and I think the risks are more around greenwashing. The risks are more. The SEC had a risk alert, and there's a lot of regulation that is going to be cracking down on fund managers as well as companies that are misleading in their disclosures or, or lacking disclosures. And I think that the big risk right now is that people that are expecting to align their investments with their values, and it could be pro fossil fuels for, for Louis, like it doesn't need to be ESG, it, it's aligning with your values. It, it could be whatever it may be, if people are not getting what they're expecting, which I think is currently happening. And th that's why we built our tool set to try to help avoid this problem, which we identified as the biggest problem. Um, I think that's what is the big risk is and could derail ESG is the lack of credibility uh, or, or a loss of credibility. Cause I think there is a, I think there's a decent amount of trust right now, but there's a potential for a loss of credibility without the right understanding and, and regulation and tools. Uh, and then in terms of where we've come, uh, we launched in, well, we, we started doing the, the company and building everything up a while before, but we launched our initial impact reporting product in November, 2019. And it has transformed not just into here, load up a portfolio and, and what's the impact of your investments, but how do you walk clients through the full sustainable investing journey? So that starts with a values discovery questionnaire uh, and a behavioral one, kind of like risk tolerance questionnaires. Let's figure out your behavior and, and what will be most relevant to you. Then the second thing is the, the main core value that we're now providing for a lot of people is you take a prospect, you figure out what their values are, you run their portfolio and diagnose their portfolio, and then you show them how much better your proposed ESG portfolio is on the issues that they care about. So that's a big thing that we've added since the start. And then the last thing is if, if you need to propose a portfolio, sometimes people are looking for guidance, research, analytics, and ways of actually building, constructing portfolios that are aligned with their clients' values. Uh, so now we also provide uh, really good fund screening, company screening, portfolio construction, and, and direct indexing capabilities. Nice. So that sounds like what my advisor needs to do, right? Make my portfolio better aligned with my values. <laughs> awesome. 
Well, Gabe, this has been a very insightful conversation, but there's one question we want to end with. Um, so we get, we get ended on time, but tell us what the impact you want to make on the profession in the industry and in the world. Sure. Uh, honestly, uh, I don't need to make an impact. I, I want the profession in the world to be in a different way. Uh, it doesn't need to come from me at all. And um, when I see, honestly, our competitors, Morningstar is an example, they're doing more and more and more on ESG. And we, we love to see that. Like that, that is a really positive thing. So in some sense, I just want to be part of this movement of helping people to align their investments with their values because it's something that people want and something that advisors need to serve their clients on what they want and it can create a really huge impact. So um, I, I just want to contribute in, in whatever way I can to that uh, and, and it'll have its impact on its own. That's awesome. Well, thanks, Gabe. Yeah, Gabe and Anna, that was great. Uh, I think uh, the the other, you know, kind of the, the plug pieces here at the end. So uh, where's the best way to kind of follow you or your stake? Uh, and I, I guess actually I, I would like to know, it, I think the name somewhat uh, kind of implies, but where did you come up with the name? It's always fun to ask people when you're creating <laughs> names, where did that occur, right? Yeah. Well, like, you know, you made the, the table stakes. Will your stake become table stakes? And, you know, it's probably not stake like, you know, Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Slayer, right? You know, which is good for the world, right? Getting rid of vampires is probably net positive, uh, you know, but yeah. <laughs> that, that would be great. Yeah, I, we um we actually have a whole bunch of icons, which we're not using enough of uh, different types of stakes. That would be like fun rewards if you do something like uh, a miss steak or a uh, <laughs> uh, silver steak or a uh, tent steak or something like that. So we, we do have a couple of those puns that are floating around the system and might need to make an appearance. <laughs> uh, we created it because it, it was really about the shareholder democracy point that I brought up earlier, that people have a stake in all of the companies and funds they invest in and that every decision that you make or decision that you don't make. Sorry, I'm going to quote one of my favorite song lyrics. I wish I didn't have to do this, but <laughs> if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. Um, if people are, that's from Rush. Uh, <laughs> if people are um, like uh, using their voice or not using their voice, every decision that they make, every investment that they uh, have is their stake in the economy and, and their stake in the system. And, it's just getting people to understand that and use your stake to better align your investments with your values and uh, create a, a world that you're happy to be in. Very cool. Well, uh, what's, so what's the website for your stake? Is it straight Your stake.org. <laughs> and it's okay. S-T-A-K-E, not, <laughs> not the food. <laughs> is, is there a your stake where you, you order like filet mignons online? Let me look yeah, that up right know. now. Yeah. <laughs> Well, as as you, as, yeah, I was like, as you looked that up, right, you, you mentioned Rush. So Getty Lee, I have a Getty Lee base somewhere in my house. I think it's in my basement. So um, I was a pretty big fan of Rush. Do you have a favorite Rush song? And have you seen, did you ever get to see them live? I wish I got to see them live. No, I've never been able to see them. Um, I'm more of a Pink Floyd fan. Uh, so I don't, okay. I don't have as much of a knowledge of Rush, but I do like... Uh, a couple of their it's more like the classics the really popular ones um yeah so sorry to, to disappoint any of the major rush heads i <laughs> won't be able to go into super depth <laughs> yeah well pink floyd's a good one too uh, money i think was the very first uh base tab i ever learned right wow. it's a nice easy one yeah so it's a good one i'm uh my favorite is on the turning away um uh, and shine on your crazy diamond so yeah. I don't know if those have as much bass, but <laughs> well, they're pretty good really too. Well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So well, um, and then you, uh, Gabe, you said you're more uh, heavily involved on LinkedIn, right? Is uh, probably the best place mm -hmm. to connect with you. Yeah. I, so you mentioned wealth management. I actually write a monthly column for wealth management, the top ESG trends that happened over the past month, um, and it's just something that you can just stay up to date on what's going on in ESG. Oh, there's a ton of new developments every month. So it's uh, curating the top five. And that's something that I'll publish all my new articles or post them on LinkedIn. They're published on wealth management. Okay. 
Well, awesome. Thank you so much for taking time out and joining us here on Framework Podcast today, sharing your story, uh, talking with us a good bit in detail on uh, ESG and you know, it was a, a a flavoring of music throughout too, and at least for the people that uh, you know watch it, get to see you know Miles Davis at work behind you, which is pretty cool. And Anna, uh, you know, we got a big takeaway for you, which is you have a whole conversation with your advisor coming up about this, which is <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> I'm excited to I'll see be, what you I'll find. Let you guys know how it goes. <laughs> yeah, please do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll be in touch about band practice. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone, and thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Framework Podcast.